Following the disappointing response to Alien 3, it was a couple of years before 20th Century Fox decided what to do next with the Alien series. And perhaps it was because of the disappointing response to Alien 3 that Fox developed Alien Resurrection directly, rather than using David Guiler, Walter Hill and Gordon Carroll at Brandywine as they had previously. The fourth film was born out of a request from Fox's Vice President of Feature Production, Jorge Saralegi, to Joss Whedon to come up with a treatment. Whedon had written Buffy the Vampire Slayer and worked on such films as Speed, Twister and Waterworld, as well as an unmade spec script called Suspension, which is described as Die Hard on a Bridge. He was also one of seven writers nominated for an Oscar for writing Toy Story. Whedon provided a 30-page treatment with a cloned newt, which Fox liked, but decided they wanted Ripley back, so Whedon started again. I'm going to look at four drafts of the script all very similar, in some cases word for word identical. A first draft dated 14 September 1995, an optional second revision dated 22 July 1996, an undated draft, and the official script published by HarperCollins. It is my belief that the undated draft actually predates the 14 September 95 draft for reasons that we'll get into, but I'll be using the September draft as a basis to compare the others. The published script boldly claims that it is the final script, unexpurgated and unaltered. In fact, pretty much every scene containing dialogue is altered, along with many that don't contain dialogue. I'm unsure if this is in fact a version of one of Whedon's drafts, or a cobbling together of different drafts. The book is dedicated to Kai, however, referring to Kai Cole, whom Whedon married in 1995. Three of the scripts start with an external establishing shot of the Auriga. When Jean-Pierre Genet was approached by Fox to direct, he pitched the idea of the teeth of a small insect that we think is an alien and a very long single-shot pullback to reveal the enormity of the Auriga. This opening was written into the 1996 draft and remained all the way through production. Huge models were constructed and shot along with the live-action plate until time and money ran out with the sequence incomplete. It was replaced with morphing footage of the failed Ripley clones for the final film before cutting to a new fly-past shot of the Auriga when Hervé Schned's credit comes up. Genet was secretly relieved when it was dropped as he felt it was a bit too comedic, despite it being originally his idea. The special edition of the film, which was not a director's cut, as Genet regards the theatrical version as his cut, completed the missing elements of this original opening and restored it. The undated and 1995 scripts next show a corridor in the Auriga, much as per the final film, followed by a fetal mass in gel apparently dreaming. The 1996 draft skips the Auriga interiors and goes straight to a dream sequence, mirroring a similar scene in earlier drafts. A woman walks through a wheat field with a young girl and we get the girl's voice repeating Newt's line about monsters from aliens. The girl is swamped with big black insects and the wheat field turns into a sea of blood. The 96 draft has the woman missing and just the girl alone in the field. The dream sequence is omitted from the published script and the film though the voiceover is retained but now voiced by Ripley. What's curious is that there's no further reference to the wheat field or its significance in the story. As we'll see later in the 95 and undated scripts, we encounter a garden and harvesters. Either of these elements might have incorporated wheat to mess with Ripley's head and leave us to wonder what's real and what isn't. Or perhaps to suggest she's kind of a Cassandra, destined to warn others of dangers but never to be believed. We're brought back to an adult-sized mass of gel, indicating that some time has passed and we track two heartbeats. This was changed in the final film, having a childlike Ripley morph into the adult. The tracking of two heartbeats is only briefly visually referenced during the surgery scene. Prior to the surgery scene, however, all drafts have another dream sequence, tracking around corridors and vents till we arrive with Ripley again, with whiteless eyes clawing at her chest. This dream has more relevance as we cut to the surgery scene, which plays out much the same in all drafts and concludes with Ripley waking up and breaking the surgeon's arm. This last part was cut for the theatrical version, but restored for the special edition. The next couple of scenes are pretty much word for word in all versions and play out the same in the film, with a couple of subtle differences. While Ripley is recovering in her cell, she crouches on the floor, catatonic. An angle from above indicates more cells other than Ripley's, leaving us wondering at the occupants. The angle used in the film leaves this aspect out. This was the first scene Sigourney Weaver shot for the film, practically naked, on November 20, 1996. 
not present in any of the scripts, is an extension of this scene that was storyboarded, where a mosquito lands on Ripley and starts drinking her blood. It then shrivels up from the acid and Ripley blows it off her arm. Janae says the scene was dropped as the CGI was too expensive. It's also a little redundant with the acid blood reveal at the end of the basketball scene later on. The examination scene mentions that Ripley lets Wren go before she is shocked, which would make sense as Wren would get shocked too. In the film, it's the shock that makes her let go. All versions of the script are much the same for the scenes where Perez, Wren and Gediman observe and discuss Ripley, and all lack any mention of Ripley reacting to the picture of a little girl as depicted in the special edition. They also lack any reference to the scientist, played by Marlene Bush, silently coaching Ripley to say the right word. The dialogue and action for the scenes where they observe the Queen are also much the same in all drafts, though more detail is provided in the earlier drafts regarding the genetic crossing. Perez asks why Ripley has memories, and Wren says there have been cases. But when Perez pushes back and pins Wren down, the latter admits that it's more likely due to the genetic mix, which hints that others might have tried to clone Ripley prior to Wren and Gediman. In the Queen's Cage, most drafts mention that there are eight guards, and in the undated and 1995 draft, the young Queen rises up behind Perez as if to attack him, before the glass and a laser grid between them is revealed. This reveal is removed from the 96 and published drafts. The 95, 96 and published drafts have a little more in terms of reference to Alien 3, with Ripley repeating Clemens' lines of, They didn't make it. They didn't survive. But also consistently spell Fiorina wrong. She also says she remembers a girl and touches her chest, bringing up an interesting question about memories and cloning, and at what point Ripley's blood samples were sourced in Alien 3. Is the line suggesting the blood samples were taken out post-mortem, and the memory of the chestburster was stored in those alien-tainted cells? Remembering, of course, that Ripley was incinerated. Either way, in the film, Ripley ignores Gediman's questions about Fiorina, so it's ultimately moot. The scene ends with Ripley sensing that the Queen has laid eggs when she says you can't teach it tricks, before correcting herself and saying them as Wren exits. The final film loses the them line and has a line from Wren that's more hostile when he scoffs at Ripley, telling her, why not, we're teaching you. One of the myriad problems Joss Whedon had with the final film was casting, and the production changing his intent with certain characters, particularly Wren and Gediman. As we'll see later on, Wren is less hostile to the pirates and works with them in trying to escape the ship before his heel turn when he shoots Call. Fox and Janae saw Wren more simply as the baddie. Unfortunately, no version of the film includes the most apt description of the aliens when Ripley refers to them as a cancer. The undated and 95 scripts feature a scene of an ensign approaching Wren as he leaves the mess hall and telling him they've been hailed. The other scripts delete this scene. The next scene is the same in every draft as the Betty roars into frame, although the reference to the scantily clad bomber babe is missing from the undated script. The next scene features the first major change in terms of characters. The undated and 95 scripts introduce Elgin, Hillard and a third character called Rain. Whedon effectively doomed this character as soon as he introduced him as slight and quiet. Rain is entirely inconsequential and disposable. He barely has any dialogue and his death later during the flooded kitchen sequence changes nothing to the story. This scene is identical in the undated and 95 drafts and as it concludes it has Elgin yelling out to Christy and another character called St. Eust that they're about to dock. Contrasted to Rain, St. Eust is given a lot more characterisation in the earlier scripts. Despite Christy being big and black and St. Eust being cool and Asian, they're generally interchangeable so it's a no-brainer that the characters were amalgamated. It's curious, though, that they kept Christie and not the more distinctive St. Eust. It's been reported that Whedon wrote St. Eust with Chow Yun-Fat in mind down to the long jacket as he appeared in John Woo movies. Fat's manager, Terence Chung, was furious about what the part offered and turned it down flat. Elgin continues through the cargo bay where we set up Chekhov's harvesters in the undated and 1995 drafts. These will come into play during the climax of the film, but their use is explained later in that Vries and Call are trying to get them running properly so they can be on sold. Also in these early drafts, Vries has no legs at all, as opposed to having paraplegia in the later scripts and the film. As such, Jonna isn't able to drop the knife into his legs in the earlier scripts, but instead turns on the harvester's blades mere inches from Vries's face. They trade insults such as limp scrotum and inbred cocksucker, and it's here we get the first indication of what I mentioned earlier, a 
about the undated script predating the 1995 script. When Jonna turns the blades on, Vries says, you fuck in the undated draft and Jesus in the 1995 draft. The undated and 95 scripts are often word for word identical, but in many scenes swear words have been removed or changed from the 95 draft. When Call meets Ripley in her cell, her line of those sick fucks is changed to those sick bastards. When Vries emerges from the elevator later on, Jonna says, oh fuck, which is turned down to, oh man. Ren says fucking bitch instead of synthetic bitch in reference to Call. There's around a dozen instances of strong language being toned down, possibly for the purpose of avoiding an NC-17 rating. Considering that the film still retained over 20 shits and fucks each, and a good deal of violence. All versions of the script, except the published version, introduce the Betty crew with a scene in the cockpit. A scene in the cargo bay with Elgin talking to Vries and Call, a scene in a hallway with Elgin and Christy and Sinust, then back to the cargo bay with Jonna, Vries and Call. The published script removes the first cargo bay scene. The final film is a lot more streamlined, starting with Elgin and Christy talking and Christy testing his taxi driver guns, then moving to the first Betty scene with Elgin and Hillard, to the end of the sequence as they start to dock. The special edition moves the scenes back to where they were originally scripted, but omits Elgin and Christie's dialogue asking about the whereabouts of the others, as it would have been redundant since he radioed them in the cargo bay earlier. The undated and 95 scripts also drop an early hint about Call when she looks at the harvesters and says, I hate machines. This was wisely dropped from later drafts, especially considering that it's her job to fix machines. All versions of the script introduce Call's name as Anna Lee in this sequence, though it never ends up being mentioned in the film. As the Betty docks, more detail is given to a large airlock on the underside of the ship. Call mentions the airlock towards the end of the film, but we never actually see the usual inner slash outer door hatch set up, as we've seen in earlier films. This comes into play during the Betty's escape from the Auriga towards the end. It's not till the 96 draft that the Betty rises up into the dock. Earlier drafts have it moving along a series of docks. The published script decides a scene similar to the dropship in Aliens. The Betty has a top hatch in all drafts, which is another detail that will come to the fore later on. All scripts but the published script feature two boarding scenes. After the first scene where they get scanned, they proceed into an antechamber where Jonna asks about whores with bad eyesight. Christy or St. Eust comment, depending on the draft, how clean the ship is. This aspect was amplified in Anne Crispin's novelisation, where Perez was very strict on keeping the Auriga as sterile as possible. It doesn't rate a mention again in the script. The scene following with Elgin and Perez is much the same in all drafts as well as the final film. One bit of dialogue in the 95, 96 and published drafts, but not in the film, is Elgin's reference to picking up Call out by the handle. What this is isn't clear, but it's presumably a region of space. Speculatively, it might be the handle to the Big Dipper constellation. Three stars in the handle are Mizar, Megrez and Alioth, all around 80 light years from Earth. In the undated draft, the handle is the Betty's next destination to try and sell the harvesters they've been trying to fix. The next sequence of scenes has the cargo being offloaded from the Betty and delivered to Medlab. The undated script misses the cargo rolling out of the Betty and jumps straight to it arriving at the Medlab door. In the 95 draft, Call and Rain deliver the cryotubes from the Betty, while in the 96 and published scripts, it's Call and Jonna, compared to Call and Christy in the film. None of Father's announcements in the film are in any of the scripts. There's some very minor differences regarding Wren and Gediman supervising the setting up of 10 cryotubes. They retire to the next room and watch as 10 eggs are lowered from the ceiling in front of each sleeper. As the sleepers start to wake, all 10 eggs open simultaneously. The basketball fight scene is almost word for word the same in every draft, and all apart from the undated draft have Ripley handcuffed throughout. Jonna gets up in Ripley's grill and she tells him to back off. She then hits him when he doesn't. Christy steps in and whacks Ripley with an ashtray, which doesn't have much effect. Hiller jumps on her back and is shrugged off before Ripley throws the basketball at her, as opposed to the opposite, which happens in the film. In the published script, Ripley hits Hillard with the basketball and the later scripts have Ripley pulling out a bloody tooth after Christy hits her. She starts to strangle Christy as Jonna comes at her again and she leaps at him instead, just as Ren and Gediman intervene. Ripley leaves complaining that Jonna smells, but it's not till the 96 draft that she does the look-away three-pointer, which was filmed on February 13, 1997. 
and famously involved a large number of takes until Weaver managed to get it, Ron Perlman nearly ruining the take by breaking character. In the earlier scripts, Sanu stands back with his hands behind his back, hinting at the guns he's hiding. Rain doesn't even rate a mention. The scene ends differently depending on the draft, with Ren commenting on Ripley's social skills or Gettyman being jokey. Personally, I think the scene in the film works a lot better without Ripley having any dialogue, especially dialogue like, Because Pain Hurts. All scripts except the undated script have an exterior shot of the Auriga as the sun sets behind Pluto, and the two later drafts both cut to the after hours montage we see in the film. The two earlier drafts have an extra scene in between, however. The most detailed version of this is in the 1995 draft. An alien is taken from a cage and loaded into an observation pen using laser grids and nitrogen as security failsafes. Ren and Gediman then leave the observation chamber and talk about reproductive anomalies with the Queen and whether it's due to the genetic cross with Ripley, which sets up the newborn later on. Ren orders more scans. The undated draft is about half the length of the 95 draft, but covers much the same ground. The after hours montage is lacking detail in the earlier drafts, though is much the same as what appears in the film, with Jonna, Christy, St. Eustace Call playing poker in the mess hall. The 96 draft removes St. Eustace and has the other three playing pool instead, which is curious as the 96 draft doesn't include Christy's trick shot ricochet later on. By the time we get to the published draft, each scene is separately detailed, with Elgin massaging Hillard's feet, Perez polishing his boots, and Vries nicking parts. It also has the three in the mess hall watching TV, per the film. All versions of the script feature at least one line of dialogue from Gettyman during his examination scene, and all versions bar the published extend the scene with Ripley walking in and they discuss how aliens communicate via ultrasonics. Ripley says she can hear them and kisses Gettyman before pulling back and shooting her tongue into his face. It's not till the 96 draft that Gettyman zapping the alien with nitrogen is introduced. The next scene has Ripley waking up in her cell, squatting in the middle of her room, wearing a collar and handcuffs. Similar to the wheat dream, this dream seems to have no point or payoff other than to reinforce Ripley's dual nature. Moreover, Ripley is absent from half the scene and it's focused on Gettyman. Returning to the mess hall in the undated and 95 drafts, so Neust wins a high stakes hand of poker, while in the 96 draft, Christy shows off his pool skills by doing some impressive bank shots. Again, pointing to his ricochet in a few scenes time, but that isn't present in this draft. Perhaps it was this scene that inspired the trick shot, though it is also absent from the published draft. Call makes her way to the prison level to find Ripley in all versions except the published script, using a power glove type contraption to crack security, evading guards. By the time of the published script, the breathing security system is in place. The undated script features a few minor changes to the scene where Call goes to murder Ripley, but otherwise most of this scene survived relatively unchanged and intact in the film. There are references to Morse from Alien 3, who wrote of his encounter on Fiorina. This dialogue about Morse wasn't restored for the special edition of the film, and based on the storyboards, it's likely to have been cut prior to shooting. All drafts have extra dialogue mainly focusing on Ripley's apathy about the inevitability of the alien. Ripley echoing calls, I can make it stop, makes more sense in later drafts as it's a response to Call not caring if she lives or dies. Call's I don't care line is missing from the undated draft. As Call departs, she is whacked in the head with a rifle butt in all drafts, rather than having a gun pointed at her head and some overacting from one of the guards. All versions of the shootout in the mess hall are much the same. Elgin is initially trying to defuse the situation more than he does in the film, and once the firing starts, Call is more involved in the fight, elbowing a guard in the teeth. St. Eust, of course, does the double gun thing instead of Christy in the later drafts and the film. Christy instead tackles a guard, while Rain gets shocked by a burner. Elgin pulls a shotgun out of his coat, which somehow got by security along with Christy's guns, Jonna's thermos gun, and Call's stiletto. Rather than calling security, Gettyman directs three guards from the med lab face to face to go to the mess hall. When the smoke clears, Call tries to leave to finish her mission, but Elgin grabs her by the hair, telling her she's not going anywhere. The scene where the aliens break out is the same in all versions, and is more or less what ended up in the film. The main difference being that Gettyman is with a guard in the script, and another scientist in the final movie. The standoff continues in the mess hall, with Call trying to convince Elgin that she has to kill the aliens. Jonna is all for shooting her. This permeates a number of scenes for the rest of the scripts, 
with Jonna being a lot more hostile towards Call, apart from a line in the mess hall in this scene where Jonna says, ice the goddamn mole, his attitude is toned down a lot more in the movie, although it is noticeable that Call isn't allowed a gun until later on. In the undated draft, Wren, now with a gun in his face, suddenly starts trying to reason with Elgin, indicating that he would let him go if Call was acting alone. In the final film, he grins smugly as Call tries to convince Elgin that the aliens have to be stopped. In the undated scripts, two more guards rush in and Jonna tells them to drop their weapons. In the 95 and 96 draft, a guard rushes in, but it's De Stefano. The published script doesn't mention De Stefano until he asks Elgin to let Ren go a couple of scenes later. It's implied that De Stefano is one of the two unnamed guards still alive after the shootout. And speaking of guards, here's where things start to get a little confused. In the undated draft, there are four guards when they leave the mess hall to make for the Betty, one of whom is De Stefano. Two are killed by an alien when the crew meet Ripley shortly after, but the third just drops off the radar. In the 95 draft, only De Stefano enters, and one guard is killed in the later encounter. Interestingly, when the new guards enter in the undated drafts and Jonna says to drop their weapons, he adds, I'm not fucking with you. This is replaced in the 95 and 96 draft to just him saying now. The guard that rushes in and points a gun at Christy in the film delivers the very line, I'm not fucking with you. Following this in the undated 95 and 96 scripts are a series of scenes showing the aliens effectively taking out the crew. The undated and 95 scripts are much the same and show dead bodies near the labs and a technician being attacked. A guard fires at an alien disappearing into a vent. More dead bodies near all the open alien cages. Ripley in her cell laughs. A wounded lieutenant informs Perez that the aliens have swept the barracks. Then we see the chaos of the barracks as a guard is killed trying to open a weapons locker while another guard fries two of his comrades while an alien just shrugs the shot off. Father calmly announces the evacuation. All versions bar the published script now cut to Vries in the engine room, not knowing what's going on, but on guard due to the alarms. He rolls out and some alien acid starts burning through the ceiling above him. He dodges it and it starts eating through the floor. This inconsequential scene was neither storyboarded nor shot. The 95 and 96 drafts, though curiously not the undated draft, now cut to Ripley's cell, where she's no longer laughing as aliens start bashing on an air vent. This scene is also missing from the published script and final film. All drafts now have much the same version of the lifeboat sequence, where an alien crawls into a fully loaded escape pod and starts killing the men inside. The unpublished drafts have a soldier outside firing a burner into the pod, hitting everything but having very little effect on the alien. It goes to spring out when the soldier rolls in a grenade, shuts the hatch and launches the pod. It flies out and explodes. In the 96 draft, it's Perez who rolls the grenade in. The official script is missing the soldier firing the burner, but includes an alien rising up behind Perez, but we cut before it attacks. The other scripts cut on the exploding lifeboat. The film, of course, has Perez being head bit from behind and plucking out part of his brain. A scene that was almost cut until it got a positive response at a test screening in Las Vegas. So blame them. All versions have everyone in the mess hall reacting to the sound of the exploding lifeboat and Ren accusing Call of causing this. They make to leave and De Stefano tries to get Elgin to free Ren, but Elgin says he can have Ren once they're off the Auriga. The earlier drafts have Elgin asking if Ren can walk and he only nods, denied the dignity of dialogue. We now cut back to Vries being stalked by an alien on the ceiling. He speeds for a closing hatch helped by an explosion tilting the ship and sending him downhill. He drops his wheelchair into a flat position in order to slide under the closing door just before the alien catches him. The published script depicts more or less what happens in the film with Vries assembling his shotgun and blasting the alien which then drips acid on him. The 95 and 96 scripts both show Ripley escaping her cell which is missing from the undated script. The 95 draft has her swinging up to the ceiling and smashing through the glass window at the top. The 96 and published drafts have her pulling out the wiring of the door locked to open it, rather than smearing acid blood as per the film. The film also has her opening an emergency door, while aliens bash down the main door. Perez, still alive at this point in the undated 95 and 96 drafts, tries to maintain order in the lifeboat bay and largely fails. He punches a soldier who disobeys him, and an alien drops down behind him. Burners have no effect, and a soldier starts firing a traditional gun. Perez tries to warn him, but acid splatters on the window. He yells at his men to get out as the window breaks and one soldier is sucked out a fist-sized hole. 
Doors slam and hardening foam fills vents as Perez and the other men are blown into space and the damaged sector is sealed off. There's a slight difference in the 96 draft where the soldier Perez punches has the gun and we think he's going to shoot the general before aiming at the alien behind him. This scene is omitted from the published script and film as Perez dies earlier. It does, however, provide more context to the survivors' need to swim through the kitchen and not being able to find a way around. The undated and 95 scripts now have the survivors arrive at a door in the adjoining sector where Elgin puts a gun to one of the soldiers' heads, asking them to open it, and Wren saying they can't. In the 95 draft, the soldier is named Lowenthal, but in the undated draft, it's De Stefano. This isn't a simple name change, as Lowenthal, who is female, and De Stefano, who is male, are two distinct characters. They move to the holding cells, a large chamber overlooking another area two levels below, when an alien drops on Elgin from above. It kills him, then wades into the others, killing an unnamed guard. Sinuse tries to shoot it, but the alien uses its tail to trip him, and he falls, hitting his head on a pipe. Lowenthal and Jonna both shoot, but have little effect. Call opens a door to reveal Ripley behind it. The alien attacks Ripley and they fight. Call tells Lowenthal to shoot both of them, which she does, the blast forcing Ripley and the creature apart. They go at it again as Call and Jonna join in the shooting. Ripley and the alien fall over the railing and land 20 feet below, the alien mortally wounded. Christy heads downstairs while the dying alien tries to kill Ripley with its inner jaw. She grabs it and tears it out, letting out a victory cry. The others arrive and Ripley hands the jaw to Call. Rain actually has a couple of lines of dialogue as they discuss their next move, and Call and Christy argue about whether to bring Ripley. It's fairly similar to what ends up in the film, with a couple of appallingly bad lines of dialogue that were fortunately removed. The 96 draft sees a number of changes. Elgin is looking at an acid hole when he's attacked, and the extended fight with the crew and Ripley and the alien has been removed. We get the first iteration of Ripley blasting a hole through Elgin's body, then a short fight ensues with the alien still alive. Again, it ends with Ripley tearing out the alien's tongue. So Neust, Rain and the third unnamed guard aren't present in this draft, though Lowenthal is. There was more to Elgin's death planned with a close-up internal shot of his heart being impaled by the aliens in a jaw. This got at least as far as visual effects tests with ADI, but it's not certain if it was actually shot for the film. The published draft cuts the scene down yet again, to be much the same as what we see in the final film, while still maintaining the dodgy dialogue. The published draft also has the short scene after where Call asks Ripley why she shot the alien, but has a little more dialogue. It's likely this was a late addition, as the scene doesn't appear to have been storyboarded. All drafts have them proceeding through the cell block until an elevator lights up. Vries emerges and we have seven pages of dialogue, much of it needlessly wordy. There's half a page about aliens' acid blood, which Vries or Wren could have easily relayed off screen since the audience already knows this piece of information. More intended dialogue about Call being a spy is also cut from the film. The final scene, as presented in the film, including a short interstitial scene where Jonna asks Ripley about her experience with the aliens and she says she died, runs for just three minutes, less than half of what it might have been. Though in the cutting of the scene, Call is at the back of the group when they aim their guns, then appears at the front in the next shot. Vries' dialogue of, hey, what you guys doing, from all drafts, was changed to, who are you expecting, the Easter Bunny, during shooting, as Dominique Pinon could not get his Gallic tongue around that and kept saying Eastern Bunny, it was finally changed to Santa Claus. The next scene where they find Purvis is the same in all drafts. In the final film, however, this scene is moved till after the clone storage scene. It creates a minor continuity error at the start of the scene, when we see Purvis walking away from the camera, despite the fact we've not met him yet. At the end of the scene, we have a couple of group shots where it appears as if Purvis has been digitally removed. The next scripted scene in the undated 95 and 96 drafts has the group continuing through the labs and finding the Queen is gone. Further on, two soldiers are fighting four aliens. They lose. Wren reckons they can lure them into the labs and freeze them with liquid nitrogen. The group try to attract the creatures, but Ripley says they sense a trap and suggests they give them call or rain. She grabs call and the aliens approach. Wren freezes three and the fourth runs away. So New shoots it before it can escape. They realise what Ripley already knew. The aliens can smell fear, and that's what attracted them. Jonna shoots the frozen aliens and they shatter. This scene is missing from the published script, doesn't appear to have been storyboarded, and obviously isn't in the film. 
though the concept was repurposed for the Frozen Guard when the aliens escape. Sir Neust and Rain aren't present in the 96 script, and depending on the draft, the line of You people are insane is spoken by either De Stefano or Lowenthal. As they depart, we cut to a shot of the Auriga flying past Jupiter, and later Ripley asks Call if she really thought she'd feed her to the aliens. Ripley just says that she wants to live and doesn't care about anything. Call thinks this makes her more human than she thought. The 95 draft extends this exchange slightly, with Ripley asking Call why she's here, and Call says to kill Ripley. Each version of this scene stops abruptly as Ripley notices a door with 1 to 7 on it. The published script starts the scene the same as the film, with Ripley stopping dead at the door. The scene is identical in all drafts and has a couple of changes from the film. The earlier draft has number 7 saying kill us rather than kill me in later drafts and the movie. It's an interesting change to ponder since clones 1 to 6 are already dead. Does number 7 mean for Ripley to kill her and then Ripley herself? Another change is the way in which Ripley kills number 7 and destroys the lab. Cole throws Ripley a grenade launcher. She launches a few before firing one at 7. It seems to be a very over-the-top macho way of doing the scene compared to Call quietly passing Ripley a flamethrower in the film and Ripley incinerating number 7 first before all the other failed clones. It's a big improvement on the script, not only using the imagery of fire to cleanse, but it's also a callback to Ripley's cathartic burning of the eggs in Aliens. There's a couple of extra lines of dialogue at the end of the scene which were best left cut, and the scene continues to De Stefano opening the hatch in the floor. In the film, we cut to a short scene of the crew walking past and Ripley recovering from the previous scene. Call stops to try and comfort her, but Ripley says nothing and they move on. This appears to have been taken from an upcoming scene in the cooling tower, where Call tries to sympathise with Ripley and the latter shrugs it off. The film now drops in the Jupiter scene, which was scripted to be before the clone scene. The scene before they swim through the kitchen manages to be different in every single draft. The 95 script starts with them climbing down into a room, into foot-deep water that becomes waist-deep by the end of the scene. Ripley finds that her hands are shaking, and Call offers her the aforementioned sympathies. Ripley actually giggles inanely and stops herself from screaming. This foreshadows her line later on in the chapel, where she tells Call she's finding things funny, but doesn't think they are. The undated script is missing the reference to the shaking hands and Ripley giggling. The 96 and published drafts extend the dialogue with Ripley telling Call she lost a tooth, but that it's grown back. The storyboards appear to indicate that this exchange may have been shot, though looking at the final film there doesn't appear to be an obvious spot where it could have been cut from, considering where Ripley and Call are positioned in the cooling tower. As they continue into deeper water, Lowenthal is spooked by a mop floating nearby, and they spend a couple of pages discussing why the tanks are flooding everything and their plans to swim through the kitchen. De Stefano and St. Eus talk about weapons and hitters, which makes De Stefano a little uneasy. The reference to Lowenthal and the mop is missing from the undated draft, and the gun discussion is missing from the 96 draft. A different version is in the published draft, which has the dialogue a little less forced as it takes place while Ripley swims ahead to scout the route. However, in footage restored for the special edition, De Stefano is very much on board with how cool disposable guns and split points are. In the published script, he's still a bit uneasy. Ripley swimming ahead of the others was storyboarded and appears as if it may have been shot. This angle on the crew during the gun discussion doesn't feature Ripley, who was at the front with Wren. It's unlikely Christie is obscuring both of them, and Purvis is looking into the flooded area as if waiting for Ripley to return. Ultimately, the theatrical version ends up being a much tighter cut of this scene. Other points of interest is an angle on the cooling towers that more strongly implicate the aliens in their damage. Also, certain lines are changed between characters, though obviously none are given to Rain. And finally, as they dive, 95 and 96 drafts have Lowenthal bringing up the rear and being pulled under. The 95 draft has the group swimming through the kitchen, not noticing Lowenthal is gone, and many make it a fair way through without incident, until Jonna notices three aliens behind them. He shoots one and the other two swim off into the shadows. One lunges out and grabs Rain, and Hillard fires as it disappears. Jonna shoots at a third, wounding but not killing it. Call, Wren and Christy and Vries encounter the webbing at the top of the stairwell that was their exit point and start to struggle. Ripley herds the others past her, then looks up to see Call trying to cut through the web. The Stefano starts to drown. Ripley swims up, rips open the webbing and surfaces only to have a face hugger jump on her. Wren and Call swim up, and a hugger jumps at Wren. Call shoots it out of the air. Christy and Vries now come up and lay down arcs of fire front and back, 
taking out the eggs. Ripley rips the hugger off underwater and its claws leave marks on her face like war paint. Three aliens pursue. The others climb out, but Christy is holding a hugger inches from his face. He throws it and Jonna shoots it. The undated draft has Cole rather unnecessarily telling him to throw it so he doesn't get acid on him. And to be honest, it sounds a little far-fetched considering it took three people to rip a hugger off Ripley and aliens. Hillard and Jonna pull an unconscious to Stefano out of the water and Cole gives him CPR. Underwater, an alien grabs Ripley but St. Eust shoots it. This segment is missing from the 96 draft after St. Eust was cut. They swim up as another alien emerges behind them. Everyone shoots it and Jonna grabs De Stefano's burner, sending a charge through the water. De Stefano regains consciousness and Ripley picks him up as they run into the adjoining elevator shaft. Aliens follow. The final version of this scene was shot in the first half of December 1996. They start climbing and four aliens smash through a hatch as Wren and Cole reach a ledge with a door. A facehugger scurries around on one of the aliens' heads. Wren asks for Cole's gun and he shoots her. She falls, landing on an elevator six levels below. Ripley leaps for Wren's ledge, but she's too late. He escapes, locking the door behind him. So Neust hooks his legs around a rung on the ladder and leans back upside down and shoots an alien. Another alien climbs up to the ledge where Ripley is and she throws herself at it, enraged. They go flying out over the shaft, Ripley grabbing a pole while the alien plummets past Cole's body. The facehugger clamps onto her, then pushes off, probing her nostrils, and abandons her, looking for a better host. An alien closes on Christy and Vries. Christy turns around and Vries grabs the ladder. Christy fires as the alien grabs him. Too close. He's sprayed with acid. Vries climbs for the both of them as Purvis rates a mention for the first time in 16 pages. As they near the top of the shaft, Hillard notices Vries lagging behind. She and Jonna climb down and find Christy dead. Vries says they just have to get him up to the med bay, but Jonna just looks at Hillard, who cuts Christy loose. Two more aliens start climbing after them as Purvis clutches his chest in pain, which eventually passes. As the aliens close in, one of the elevators starts up towards them. It stops and Cole sticks her head through the hatch in the top, urging them to get on. An alien smashes through the floor of the elevator and Ripley yells for Cole to stop. The elevator carries halfway up a door and Ripley wrenches it open. Everyone piles into the corridor and Ripley blasts the cable, sending the elevator car and alien to the bottom of the shaft, taking the second creature with it. And Jonna delivers this deleted gem. The other versions of this sequence are all very similar, including the published As It Appears on the Big Screen script. In this script and the 96 draft, Hillard is taken as they are trying to cut through the web, which poses something of a problem. Hillard dies on page 72 of the 96 draft, but has dialogue on page 73 and 77 as if she was still alive. We don't hear from her after that. No doubt this is a result of someone missing continuity errors during several revisions. St. Eust is missing, as is the latter hang, which was eventually given to Jonna in the film. The 96 and published scripts both have Jonna shooting the spider, however, and all drafts have the hugger investigating Call, while in the film, she falls back into the water. The 96 script also has Christy cutting himself from Vries, rather than Hillard doing it, which is repeated in the official draft. Missing from the official draft is Call coming to the rescue in the elevator, and is much the same as the final film with her appearing behind the previously locked door. Following, we have another fairly lengthy scene where Call was revealed to be a robot, an LM7, or Auton, from the 96 draft onwards. Curiously, she has white blood in the earlier drafts, and blue blood in the later ones. The content of the scene is much as the same as it appears in the film, with the earlier drafts shifting some of the dialogue around to include St. Eust and Hillard. St. Eust asks Ripley why she couldn't sniff Call out. Ripley says Call was gut shot in the undated draft versus took it in the chest in the others. Vries is disgusted to find out Call is a robot, while in the final film he seems more sad than disgusted. Jonna talks about Call's value as a piece of contraband. Call's voice distorts slightly, similar to Ash in Alien. Instead of trying to open a door, they start dismantling a wall. Jonna suggests just blowing a hole in it, but Hillard or De Stefano point out that they're right next to the upper hull. De Stefano also mentions they can cut through the garden, then down a few levels to the docks. In the chapel, Call accesses Father and again it plays out much the same as the special edition of the film, though the scripts have some foreshadowing of the Queen and aliens in Waste Tank 5. The 95, 96 and published scripts have a short cutaway to Purvis having chest pains, but this is missing from the undated draft, which just cuts to the others working on dismantling the wall. The 95 draft has St. Eust coming to tell Ripley and Call they're almost there, while the undated draft has Purvis telling them, 
and the 96 draft has to Stefano. The chapel scene ends in the 95, 96 and official scripts on a shipwide announcement and call asking if she really sounds like that. Parts of the chapel scene cut from the theatrical version were restored for the special edition. The 95 and undated drafts now feature probably the most famous deleted sequence from Alien Resurrection, the garden. Breaking through the wall, they head down a short corridor where Purvis says how tired he is. Jonna says, sleep when you're dead, and Ripley counters with, don't count on it. So Neust offers Purvis some uppers. He doesn't know what they are exactly. Purvis takes them anyway. They enter a huge hydroponic garden, and we have another exchange where someone explains stuff. Ripley has a brief headache, but shakes it off. They pile into a flatbed jeep with Ripley driving and DeStefano navigating. They speed past wheat, corn and cannabis. They look at it in wonder and Hillard says she always wondered where the government got its funding. An instant later an alien leaps out of the undergrowth and bites her in the head before the others can shoot it. Another alien jumps out but Ripley floors it and it misses them. They're soon surrounded on all sides. Vries shoots one but one tackles Jonna off the car, dropping his gun. He clings to the side with the alien clutching his feet. Sunyust is too tied up on his side of the car when shots ring out. Purvis has shot the alien holding Jonna and he climbs back on. Another alien lands on Sunyust, ripping open his midsection before he can shoot it. The assault continues as Ripley madly drives down some terrace slopes and into a narrow corridor, glassed on each side. She hits the brakes at the top of some stairs and they pile out. Aliens enter the corridor and they start firing at them, blood splattering the windows and Call's voice comes across the PA, warning of a hull breach. They run down the steps, all except St. Eust, who is bleeding badly. They urge him to follow, but he walks towards the horde of aliens firing both guns. More blood eats into the windows. He pops more pills, his guns run dry, and flicks two more from his sleeves and continues firing. Those guns run dry just as the hull is breached, blowing St. Eust and the aliens out into space. The others just escape the decompression, but Ripley is held back against a closed door. As she tries to get up, she senses the Queen close and in pain. Six aliens burst through the floor and close on Ripley. She throws Call 15 feet out of harm's way before she passes out and is taken. This image often pops up online when the garden scene is discussed, but is in fact a mock-up from a magazine article presented as a what-if. The scene was not shot. The undated draft has the same sequence of events with a little extra swearing. However, the 96 draft has already cut the sequence, an early victim of budget cuts that would plague the film. The following sequence with the Viper Pit didn't appear till the 96 draft, and was also due to be cut until Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder pled their case with studio head Bill Mechanic in February 1997 to save it along with a number of other scenes. It was ultimately filmed in late March. With the garden scene cut, the group crawled through the hole in the wall and into the alien hive. The hive also ended up being cut back to the survivors just discovering slime on their shoes. The later versions play out much the same as the film in terms of dialogue, but everyone sans Ripley ends up at a window overlooking the dock, which Call shoots out. They start to climb through as they notice Ripley is gone. Call goes back while the others continue to the ship. Ripley is dragged through the floor by six aliens into the aforementioned viper pit and is taken to the hive. Purvis returns for Call, urging her to leave. The aliens carry Ripley through air ducts one hanging from the ceiling with Ripley draped over its chest, and all scripts have us seeing the aliens secrete their hive resin from their backs in the earlier drafts, and it's left unspecified in later drafts. Ripley is stuck to the wall. The cocooning wasn't storyboarded, nor does it appear to have ever been filmed, considering Ripley is left uncocooned in the movie. But in the script and storyboard, she is cocooned to the wall with ten others, all looking down on the Queen, lying on her back with a distended belly. The storyboard changes this to eight people and may have been intended to echo the egg hatching scene earlier in the film. The final film is less clear about how many hosts are present. There's even a skeleton visible, which isn't too common in hives. Four or five aliens tend the queen who is having labour pains. Gediman explains the queen has multiple reproductive cycles, which was flagged way back on page 26. Ripley wonders why he hasn't been impregnated and he says that he's being drained. Blood drips from multiple wounds onto the ground. Ripley struggles to escape, but the Queen screams and the aliens tending her chitter. Gettyman asks if she wants to see what happens next. The undated draft goes into more detail about the Queen's reproductive system, with Gettyman saying they found six sets of ovaries, while the 96 and published drafts have him talking about them trying to bypass the egg-laying part of the cycle, but then the second cycle happened on its own due to Ripley's DNA. The references to Gettyman being drained of blood are missing from these drafts. 
In the final film, after the scene of Ripley being taken to the hive, we cut back to the Betty crew boarding and preparing to put Purvis in the freezer. Wren appears, shooting Purvis and taking Cole hostage. Purvis births his alien through Wren's head, and Cole, Jonna and DeStefano pump the two men an alien full of bullets. This is all done in one continuous sequence. While the scripts all cut back to Ripley in the waste tank, after Wren tells DeStefano to drop their weapons, and Purvis starts to convulse. Ripley tears at the hive webbing and starts to make progress as the queen shrieks and her belly rips open to reveal the newborn, a white, eyeless, spider-like, six-legged abomination that's almost as big as the queen herself. It crawls up to its mother and rips her face off. A soldier nearby wakes up and the newborn leaps on him, holding his head with pincers while its tongue shoots down his throat and drains the blood from him. It then jumps on an awestruck Gediman. The undated draft is much the same, but doesn't mention the newborn killing the queen. The 96 and official drafts do mention killing the queen, but the spidery description is gone, and it's now starting to sound more like the creature from the film. The spider design sounds more like a Kenner toy, unless Joss Whedon was perhaps hoping to make it a weird amalgam of human, chestburster and facehugger, though there's never been any indication that that was the case. All scripts now cut back to the Betty where the standoff continues until Purvis launches himself at Wren. Wren fires repeatedly and shoots to Stefano in the face, the other shots missing everything. Call and Jonna dive for cover as Purvis knocks the gun from Wren's hand and as the doctor is on his knees trying to pick it up, Purvis grabs his head and holds it to his chest. The burster crashes through Wren's head and wriggles out, going after Vries. In the 96 and published versions, De Stefano is only hit in the shoulder and not killed. The film changes this by having Call, Jonna and De Stefano unload into the two men and we cut from Jonna screaming to Ripley in the hive and it too is presented as one continuous scene without the intercutting of the script. In the waste tank, Ripley has freed one arm as the newborn finishes draining Gediman to a husk. It soon targets her and leaps just as she breaks out and falls into a pool of blood and ichor 30 feet below. She emerges brandishing a gun belonging to the soldier from the previous scene, one that fires actual bullets, and mows down a bunch of aliens, also hitting but not killing the newborn. More aliens jump to the newborn's defence and she shoots them out of the air. Some bullets go astray and light streams in from an adjoining chamber. Ripley fires more at that wall, creating a hole, which she smashes through. Spotting a vent in the roof, she starts to climb. This scene is the same in the undated draft and almost the same in the other drafts, but for a major change. Instead of attacking Ripley after killing Gediman, it jumps over and looks at her, then licks at the hive resin, dissolving it. It wraps her arms around her, and a dripping protuberance emerges from a slit in its belly. It wants to mate with Ripley. Repulsed, Ripley frees herself and falls into the blood and gunk, and the scene progresses the same, the newborn no longer in the mood for love. The protuberance was part of ADI's design for the newborn, and made it as far as shooting, before everyone got cold feet at the last minute, and it was digitally removed in post-production. Back on the Betty, the chestburster scurries after Vries while Jonna shoots at it. Call warns him not to, as the Betty's hull is too thin. It leaps at Call, and she manages to flick her stiletto out of her wrist, skewering the creature, spraying some acid on her and the floor, but ultimately killing it before the knife melts. The undated draft is the same, but with some more swearing. The other scripts have a different ending to the scene, with Call running to the hatch to drop the burster outside, catching dripping acid with her hand to prevent a hull breach. All drafts now cut back to Ripley, climbing a vertical shaft, pursued by two aliens and the newborn. She rips a boiling hot pipe off the wall, using the steam to slow them down. The later drafts ditch the aliens and only have the newborn following. Following this is an establishing shot of Earth with a gigantic latticework of an orbital shell. The Auriga heads for a gap. Back to Ripley running to the docks, smashing through a window, which must be a different window to the one Call shot out a few scenes back, as Call slash Father's voice announces the airlock doors closing. At the far end of the docks, the Betty descends into the lock. Ripley sprints and leaps 50 feet to the Betty below, just as the inner doors of the airlock close. Vries, Jonna and Call hear a thud of Ripley hitting the upper hull, but figure they'll shake off whatever it is. Ripley crawls for the hatch as the newborn appears at a window in the inner doors overhead. The outer doors open to reveal blue sky and the earth below. Just as the Betty shoots out and away from the Auriga, the newborn also lands on top of the ship. Both Creature and Ripley barely manage to cling to the Betty as the Auriga roars overhead. 
it crashes into deserted snow-capped mountains. The undated draft is again the same, however the 96 draft features a number of changes. First is that the Stefano is still alive, but the bigger difference is that they notice Ripley on the hull, and Call goes back and opens the hatch to let her in. Ripley straps in and they hear a noise outside, just as they fly out the airlock. The Auriga crashes into empty terrain. The published draft has a short scene of De Stefano questioning if Fries can actually fly the Betty before Ripley enters the docks. Once she lands on the Betty, she is able to open the hatch herself and board, a glimpse of something moving behind her. A hatch warning light comes on, and Call checks a bank of monitors, seeing Ripley a second before she walks into the cockpit. The rest of the scene plays out similar to the film, with Ripley taking over piloting and Call going back to check on the unlocked hatch, only to meet the newborn who closes it. The Betty escapes the Auriga, which crashes into the ocean, as Call evades the newborn in the cargo bay. The storyboard also has yet another take on the newborn getting on the Betty. The camera pans with Ripley as she heads forward and we get a brief look at the newborn behind the closing hatch. The film doesn't have this camera movement and we cut straight to the cockpit. Also throughout all the scripts, but missing from the film, is Call's voiceover on the Auriga's PA after she connects in the chapel. In the film, after she disconnects, the voice returns to father. In the 1995 script, the Betty races ahead of the exploding Auriga and starts to suffer malfunctions. Fires break out and Jonna tries to extinguish them. Ripley clings to the top of the ship while bashing on the hatch. The newborn, described as having tendrils, tries to get her. Jonna notices via an external monitor and tells the others. Cole says to let her in, but he says there's something else outside with her. The ship bucks, sending Ripley flying, only managing to hang on by clutching one of the newborn's legs. The hatch opens and the creature is torn between it and going after Ripley. Call pops out and fires a grenade at the newborn. A second shot goes wide, but Call is able to get Ripley inside as snowy mountains loom close. Call and Vries try to control the crashing Betty through a forest, and the newborn climbs to the rear to avoid debris. They notice it's near the engines, and Call hits the thrusters, sending the scorched creature flying. Unfortunately, now the ship is completely out of control and crashes. Call is up and straight out to make sure the newborn is dead, and it sticks its badly burned head into the hatch the tongue shooting out. Call falls back and the creature disappears. There's another debate about what to do and Call says that it's half an hour old and who knows what it will grow into and what if it reaches civilization. Ripley tells her that she can't catch it. The undated script plays out the same. The 96 draft has Ripley and Stefano in the cockpit as they escape the Auriga and fly over Paris, losing control and eventually crashing into a starship graveyard near a huge magnetic crane. The official draft doesn't feature the ship landing at all, but also doesn't finish the way the film does either, but more on that later. Returning to the 95 script, Ripley takes off after the newborn at the fastest superhuman speed that her hybrid nature allows. Nearby, the newborn is huddled in a ball, shivering as a membrane on its back begins to shift. Just after sunset, Ripley comes to a halt at the edge of a forested cliff and sees the lights of a large city on the horizon. Suddenly the newborn rises in front of her, attacking, cutting her leg and knocking the grenade launcher out of her hands. It shivers and screams as it towers over her, and leathery, bat-like wings spring out of its back. Ripley grabs for the launcher, but the creature hits her with one of its wings and advances, forcing Ripley to scramble backwards. It takes flight and wheels towards the city. Ripley leaps off the cliff after it, landing on its back. It tries to shake her off and Call roars in, flying one of the harvesters from the Betty. She hits the newborn and Ripley is thrown back against the cliff, falling down until she uses her nails to dig into the rock face. Call and the newborn battle until the robot can free herself and takes off through the forest, does a 180 and flies back at the creature. They collide with the newborn getting knocked to the ground and Call crashing the harvester on its roof. The creature rises again, its wings ruined, and heads for the upended harvester. Ripley climbs to the top of the cliff, and Call tells her to let the newborn come. Ripley spots her grenade launcher and runs for it, firing at the newborn, forcing it back. Her ammo runs out, and she leaps at it, the both of them ending up on the harvester blades. Call pulls a lever, and the blades spring to life, shredding the monster. Acid blood rains down on the trapped Call, and Ripley pulls herself from the dying newborn's grasp and drags Call out, just in time for the harvester to explode. They cling to each other and watch as the newborn burns. Later, the two women, along with Jonna and Vries, share a bottle of whiskey around the still-burning harvester and plan their next move. 
plenty of places to get lost as they stare at the distant city. Paul asks Ripley what she thinks, and she says she doesn't know. She's a stranger here herself. The undated draft plays out the same, but omits the newborn's wings. Ripley ends up over the cliff after being smacked with a tentacle, rather than falling off the creature when Call hits it with the harvester. In the 96 draft, Jonas celebrates their landing in the junkyard and wheels Vreese out in a backup chair. They find themselves surrounded by angry armed locals. Jonah tries to calm them in French, but a child suddenly starts screaming. De Stefano wonders what the problem is and doesn't see the newborn rising up behind him. It grabs him, pops the top of his head off and drains his blood, its own veins turning visibly red. The people panic and scatter. Ripley grabs one of the dropped rifles and Jonna drags Vries out of harm's way. Ripley fires at the newborn, but it uses the not-quite-dead De Stefano as a shield and Ripley ends his torment. It laughs and takes off after the locals whom Call is trying to herd to safety. It catches one woman and eats her. It eventually climbs to the top of a huge pile of scrap and sees Paris on the horizon, sighing in ecstasy. Distracted momentarily, it yanks up a piece of metal and finds a group of children cowering underneath. It grabs one, just as Call descends on it screaming and clawing. It drops the child and bites Call's shoulder. Blue android blood fills its veins and it gags, dropping Call as Ripley appears, emptying her rifle into it. Ripley then runs at it and they both tumble off the mountain of metal into the valley below. Ripley breaks a leg in the fall and the newborn isn't much better. It pursues her through the wreckage, ending up in a tin shed. Call scrambles down after them, the wound in her shoulder opening up. She touches it, looks at the blood, and then has an idea, shouting for Jonna. The roof of the tin shed is destroyed by the magnetic crane, just as the newborn grabs Ripley and Jonna signals to Call. The android, jacked into the controls, activates a switch. The newborn senses something wrong and the blue blood around its mouth starts to dribble upwards. The metallic blood it drank from Call is attracted to the crane's disc and it is thrown up six feet, sticking to it, still holding Ripley. They fight as Jonna directs Call towards the trash compactor. Just before the crane reaches it, Ripley frees herself and falls 30 feet. Call deactivates the crane and the newborn falls into the compactor. Vries slams the lid closed, but the newborn smashes it open. Too late. Vries activates the machine and the newborn is crushed. Acid eats through the compactor and it gets its head and arm out clawing for Ripley. She picks up a metal pole and drives it through its head, its dying scream hitting her like electricity. Call helps her up. Later, Jonna, Call and Vries sit around a fire drinking Elgin's good whiskey. Vries says they should head east to the Soviet. Call finds Ripley nearby staring at the city and they have a similar exchange ending with the familiar, I'm a stranger here myself. Finally, the official script has the same sequence of Ripley jumping onto the Betty through the closing airlock and boarding. Call goes back to close the hatch that Ripley thought she had closed already and finds the newborn. It closes the hatch and the Betty escapes. Call and the creature play cat and mouse as the Auriga hits atmosphere, burning and then crashing into an ocean. With the Betty malfunctioning, Jonna sends to Stefano back to get Call to turn on the auxiliary pump. The newborn has Call cornered under some machinery but she jams her knife through its hand and into some equipment, trapping it as she escapes. She joins De Stefano, who aims his rifle as acid blood frees the newborn, and it leaps at him, jamming the rifle stock straight through his chest, killing him. Back in the cockpit, Vries yells out to call, and Ripley realises something is wrong. She heads back aft. She finds Call cornered, and casually pulls the gun out of De Stefano's chest. The newborn grabs Call, using her as a shield, and we have a standoff. Ripley smiles and lowers the gun. The creature lets go of Call as Ripley coos to it. They caress each other and Ripley runs her hand over its teeth, cutting herself and flinging blood at the window. The sequence continues the same as the film, with the newborn getting sucked through the small hole and the Betty hitting the atmosphere. Call and Ripley cling to each other to avoid sharing the newborn's fate as Vries and Jonna finally gain control. The two women stare out the window at the earth below and Ripley delivers her line. Much of this version of the film's climax dates from a rewrite on April 1, 1997. Joss Whedon says other endings including one in a maternity ward and another in a desert, each trying to work around the budget. Yet another undated scripted ending had them landing the Betty in a snowy landscape for the final scene, which ended up in the comic adaptation. A scene of Ripley and Call, without Jonna and Vries, was shot against a green screen in 1997 
and was later reincorporated into new footage of the Betty landing in the Starship graveyard, with a familiar ship in the background. This was included as an alternate ending to the 2004 special edition of the film. So, it's easy to see that the story didn't deviate much from Joss Whedon's original drafts in 1995. Everything is effectively in place, apart from the finale, and was continually refined as time went on and the budget dictated what needed to be cut. Rain was a very obvious character to cut early on, as he said very little and did even less, and his death barely even rates as an afterthought. Ditto the soldier Lowenthal, whom the other characters don't even notice has disappeared at the start of the underwater kitchen sequence. So Neust was a more interesting deletion, but as mentioned, when Chow Yun-Fat turned down the role that was clearly aping the film A Better Tomorrow, it was perhaps thought to drop the character and incorporate his dialogue into Christie, who was a bit of a non-entity early on, and very close to Sinust anyway. Considering this was being written four years before The Matrix aped a better tomorrow with long coats and two guns, possibly it was a missed opportunity. Fox had high hopes for the film, and Tom Rothman said they were planning a sequel with Weaver and Ryder returning, and Whedon again handling the script. When the critical response was mixed and the box office lacklustre, particularly domestically in the US, any further plans got shelved. In the years since, Whedon has been scathing of the film, saying in an interview in 2005 that they got everything wrong. Casting, direction, score, production design and acting, even criticising how lines were delivered. He also criticised Halle Berry's delivery as Storm in X-Men. However, he took no responsibility for his script, which is a little odd in that the Betty and her crew seemed to be a dry run for Firefly. To be fair to Whedon, Janae did have some freedom with the studio to rework parts of the script more to his liking, and had Whedon include things the writer didn't like or want, and budget cuts meant a couple of action sequences got cut, like Ripley's first fight with the alien and the garden scene, and there was originally a lot more to the elevator shaft scene, and the constantly downsized endings. This meant that a lot of scenes where the characters stand around and have a talk seem longer because there's no action to break them up. One example is when they use Call to lure the aliens into the liquid hydrogen trap. There's three and a half pages of discussion and arguing, and an action scene described in two sentences. A lot of the talky scenes were condensed for the film, and the bickering banter was mercifully scaled back, or changed, including some of Whedon's appalling one-liners. Even John's memorable must-be-a-chick thing polarises audiences, with some finding it funny, while others think it's stupidly quippy, coming at the end of possibly the best scene in the film. So in the wash-up, it was always a case of there being too many scenes in the scripts that Whedon wrote where they stand around and have a talk, and there's often a complete lack of tension and urgency. Ripley's dual nature and how much of the original Ripley is in there is interesting right from the outset, but at the same time, she's portrayed a little too much as an Amazon warrior with hand-to-hand combat with the aliens, war cries, an obsession with grenade launchers, and even a facehugger scratching war paint into her face. To be fair, the connection to Call is also there, so it's not all cliched feminism equals women who literally kick ass and nothing else. But there is a lot of that, which is again fortunately toned down in the film. In the script, Ripley goes from being shocked and surprised that she's shocked to enraged after Call is shot by Wren, which is a little odd considering her last interaction with Call wasn't exactly friendly. In the film, she barely reacts, which is more in keeping with Ripley's arc at that point. We can see that Whedon was trying to repeat the warrior mother thing from Aliens with Ripley's relationship with Call, but she's a bit too much warrior, and it doesn't quite work when Call has a lot more agency than Newt did. Ripley's superpowers are also toned down in the film, though it wasn't enough to avoid criticism about it being too comic booky. The garden scene serves no real purpose and would have been a long, expensive shoot, though admittedly could have been pretty spectacular visually, particularly when followed by the decompression scene. Concept artist Sylvain Despretz believed it would be dropped as soon as he read the script because it didn't progress the story at all. All it seemed to do was provide a change in the colour palette from brown to green. It was also undermined by some use saying towards the end of the scene that he was bored, which is an open invitation for the audience to agree. Despretz was even less complimentary in a 2017 interview with Kent Hill. David Guiler also thought the script was terrible, and though he, Hill and Carroll were credited as producers on the film, they had no direct involvement in the production. Whedon's reaction to the final film and his apportioning of blame 
was possibly a red flag for revelations that emerged in 2020 and 2021 about his treatment of his co-workers on the TV shows Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Firefly and the film Justice League. Jean-Pierre Genet has long had a pragmatic view of his film, saying that he still likes it to this day, but understands that it's not to everyone's tastes. In regards to Whedon's criticism, he responded in an interview with The Independent on the occasion of the film's 25th anniversary. And what does he have to say about the changes he made to the script? <laughs> 